All right, good evening. It's a little after 6.30. Welcome to the Pasco School Board of Directors regularly scheduled board meeting. Um, Ms. President Phillips is out this evening ill. She's gonna try and call in and take part in the meeting here and take part in our reports and discussion and action items. But we'll go ahead and get started this evening um, with our call to order. And we have our flag salute. We have McClintock Elementary School students here this evening online. Can we uh, go ahead and introduce each of our students? Absolutely. Uh, good evening, um, board members and Superintendent Whitney. Um, uh, my name is Waylon Duncan. I'm the principal of Barbara McClintock STEM Elementary School, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, several members of our student council. Uh, we have our student council president, uh, Sasha Garcia, uh, our vice president, Radley Jesperger, uh, our blue vest leaders, Jameson Temple and Carrie Groom. And also we have Reese Sanchez, who also serves on our student council and, and does a lot of work for our school. Um, so they are, the, they are uh, our representatives today that are gonna lead us in the flag salute. All right, thank so you. So we'll, we'll turn it over to you guys. All right, uh, thank you. All right, now we'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, of the United States, States of America, America and to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, student leaders. Thank you for coming this evening. Uh, we encourage you as always. I don't. You can see in the front here of the of the dais, we have uh, three student board representatives from three of our high schools here in in Pasco, and we encourage you when you become a junior or senior to apply to be a student board representative, and up until that time, continue to be active in your student leadership groups, your student council, and uh, be be good role models for your fellow classmates. So thank you for coming this evening. Next, we'll move on to roll call. Uh, Ms. Richardson, please call the roll. Present. 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 Excuse, oh, she's, she's here. Present. All right, thank you. We'll move on to the agenda review. On to the special recognition, we have Mr. Shane Edinger. Well, good evening, Board Vice President Lehrman, Superintendent Whitney, and members of the board. Tonight, we are honoring the service of school board member Sherry Lankin. Tonight is Sherry's final board meeting here with us. She was sworn in as a Pasco School District school board member in March of 2007 and she spent the last 14 years diligently working on behalf of Pasco's students and families. There are literally hundreds of examples of Ms. Lankin's continuous commitment to Pasco students, whether she was helping out our littlest learners in kindergarten learn how to have breakfast and lunch at school for the first time, or she was attending eight graduation ceremonies over a span of 72 hours, Sherry has always been there, leading with her heart and passion for Pasco kids. 
As many of you know, the job of a board member does not begin and end here in this boardroom. It also extends to concerts, theater performances, sporting events, math and science nights, regional and statewide conferences, school visits, and graduations. Sherry's commitment to seeing students succeed was always evident as she thoughtfully weighed each decision she made as a board member, and she worked with the board to guide the district through more than a decade of continual enrollment growth, which included the construction of a new high school, five new elementary schools, and a new middle school, along with a new building for Stevens Middle School and a new home for New Horizons High School. That is a lot of groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings. On behalf of the students, families, and employees of the Pasco School District, we want to thank you for your volunteer service, Sherry, and for making a positive difference for our students, our community, and our future. And Superintendent Whitney has a, a plaque to present to you. Uh, we'd love to get some photos as well, so if you'd like to come down off the dais, and we'll take the, get that all taken care of. So, Ms. Lankin, we thank you for your service. I believe that the board and maybe some staff, student board representatives, wrote some, some words on there on what you've meant to us and what you meant to the district. And um, I thank you for mentoring all of us. You've been on the board longer than us. Some of us have now been on the board eight years, three of us, I guess. But you were on the board when we came. So thank you for your leadership for the board and the district. And is there anything you'd like to say? It was a hard decision not to run. I felt guilty, <laughs> but um, I, I've enjoyed, it's always, always, for me, it's always been about the, the children and the kids of Pasco and um, all of the kids, you know, and, and bringing um, everything to Pasco for the kids. So I thank everyone that's helped me along and um, thank you. I told her no plaque, <laughs> but thank you. So <clears throat> I do want to say thank you, Sherry. So you were on the board. I think you were the board president the first year that, that uh, we were on the board. And uh, thank you for your leadership. And thank you for watching out for students. I know that was one of your passions is to be out with the students. And I just appreciate your example and appreciate your work. And uh, wish you the best now and whatever you're going to do from here on out with all your spare time. So, <laughs> but thank you. Thank for you. Your service. All right, let's give Miss Lincoln one more round of applause. <laughs> all right, so after tonight, Miss Lincoln will join the ranks of retired school board members. We also have another retired school board member here, Dr. Aaron Richardson. If you want to stand up, Aaron, thanks for coming in tonight. All right, next we'll move on to audience comments. Uh, we, as a, as a Pasco School Board of Directors, value input from our, our community and from our students and from our staff. If there's anybody who'd like to speak, please approach the microphone. Uh, we'll give you two minutes. Ms. Sarah Thornton will hold up some cards, uh, a red card when your two minutes are up. Please try to hold it to two minutes and be t I'll call on some on people if you'd like to speak stand up i'll call on you we'll give you two minutes and we will sanitize between each person that comes up to speak after we're done in the room here we will go to the 
did the Zoom meeting and see if we have anybody online that would like to speak. So in the, in the boardroom here, is there anybody who would like to address the board? And then please state your uh, name and affiliation with the district. Good evening, Superintendent Whitney and members of the board. My name is Amanda Brown, and I am a parent to two students that are in the district at McLaughlin Middle School and Pasco High School. I am also an educator in neighboring districts, and I teach dual language. I am wanting to speak tonight about redistricting for board positions in, in Pasco School District. So the current system of having five at-large positions is not equitable to our population. And I wanted to bring up a, um, a comment or a discussion I had with President Phillips at our last board meeting where she asked me if Kennewick would be redistricting since that's where I work and I responded no. And the, the simple reason is that Kennewick is, the population is made up and is distributed differently than it is in Pasco and to understand why we have to kind of go into the history of Pasco and the history of the Tri-Cities. So um, the Tri-Cities experienced the exponential amount of growth from 1943 to 1945 when the Manhattan Project was started. And about 15,000 of those people were people of color, black people that came to work at Hanford. Um, because Kennewick and Richland were sundown towns, those black people lived in Pasco and had to be in Pasco at sundown or face prosecution. Um, although those Jim Crow laws were repealed during the civil rights um, movement and the, those things that happened during the 1960s, we still see the residue of the, those racist practices in Pasco today. Um, as in, uh, in East Pasco, we still have a large community of color, which is a very important and thriving part of our community. But as we have such a large Hispanic uh, population still in East Pasco, we do not see that representation here on the board, which is why I believe that having um, four or ideally five uh, district positions here on the board would more equitably represent those people of color that make up such an important, vibrant part of our community. So you as members of the board will have the opportunity to discuss maps tonight that the demographer has put together and decide how to move forward. These, uh, the racist practices that have existed in the Tri-Cities um, don't have to be part of our future. Creating a board with, with these positions will, you will have the opportunity to change our racist past and advocate for more equity for Pasco citizens and especially for our students. All right, thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you for your comments. My name is John Rose. I live south of 182 and west of uh, 395 in that thing we call a donut hole in the county. I'm here to put a face to the levy discussion, the levy decisions that's before you. We bought our property and built a home in 96. Total cost, land, house, which we did a lot of work, 180,000. 2017, the actual tax assessment was 289. Can still live with the taxes at that point. As you know, things have changed since then. My tax assessment and value is going to be at 487000 next year. Now, with that money, I think, Mr. Lerman, you had mentioned the fact that, indeed, some of this you were contemplating last time we, we met. With an assessed value, that per thousand value, that actually monies come to the school district, you've received a windfall of money over the last three years, and it looks like it's not going to stop anytime soon, unless there's a real crunch to the economy. If you're on a fixed income, which we are, that gets a little disastrous pretty quick if that's clip at better than $50,000 assessed value increasing every year. It'd be nice if I could just take a chunk of the house and sell it and pay the taxes with it. As you know, a house is a liability, not an asset. It'd be nice to think I actually owned the house, but if I stop paying the taxes, I find out very shortly that's not the truth, is it? Same thing with your homes. Don't pay the taxes, they'll come and take it, and they'll pay the taxes for you. So it's not like we have a choice. So I, I just want to 
put a face with what's happening economically with f fixed incomes. People like me are out here by the thousands. So I appreciate that opportunity and I know that you are doing your best. Just realize that you have a windfall of money. I hope that you spend it wisely because certainly my income's not coming up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Superintendent Whitney, uh, Vice President Lehrman, and members of the board, my name is Aaron Richardson, and I'm a Pasco resident and former board member, and I just wanted to come and express gratitude to uh, the board and the district for their grace and thoughtfulness and diligence uh, in working, uh, performing their work over these last two years, which have been very challenging to, uh, to everyone, to the students and staff in our district and to families. Um, I do believe that uh, we have a bright future ahead and have, have great hope uh, that things are going to improve significantly. Um, I wanted to thank the district for providing more flexibility to families. Uh, I know a lot of families that have taken advantage of many of the programs that the district's uh, developed, and I think that's been a wonderful thing for, for many of our families and students. That being said, even those that, that have decided to homeschool or private school or pursue alternative learning experiences, uh, they still benefit and have a great interest in the success of our school district as the growth and vibrancy and strength of our community uh, is tied to a strong public education system and so uh, we all have an interest in uh, the upcoming levy and in supporting our school system uh, finally i just wanted to come and express gratitude myself for miss lankin um, i believe she served on the board for 14 years if i calculated it right and i served on the board uh, next to her for four years and always appreciated her thoughtfulness and kindness and consistency and and being at our meetings and and for her judgment and the way she uh, thought through important issues that we faced and i felt a kinship because i also enjoyed a great deal visiting schools and being with the students and staff uh, as part of my time on the board, and I know that was something that Ms. Lincoln enjoyed and, and did quite well, and uh, so I just wanted to thank you. Serving on the board is a big responsibility and takes a lot of time, and it's a, I appreciate everyone's efforts and hope to continue to see more involvement uh, from our community in that, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richardson. Is there, there anybody else in the boardroom audience here that would like to comment? Good evening, uh, John Kennedy, resident of Pasco. And I just wanted to uh, echo on some of the comments that were made uh, just a moment ago about redistricting. Obviously, this is an important process. And uh, after reviewing the maps in the board packet, I think that map number, the, the, the map with four districts and one at large seems to be a good compromise between some of the comments and past board meetings expressing desire for at least one at large seat. and the need to make sure our board of directors is representative of our city's pop of our of our Pasco school district's population and i also believe that a uh, a member elected from a district can balance the needs of their constituents in that district with the needs of the district overall the Pasco school district overall it is possible to balance and meld competing interests, and oftentimes the interests of a specific community and the interests of the Pasco School Board are one and the same anyway. So I don't necessarily believe that you need an at-large representative to be able to represent the entire school district. I think it is possible to elect members from specific districts, and working collaboratively together, working together in a collaborative way, can meet the interests of both their, their neighborhoods and their constituency and the wider district as well. And I think you see this with the legislature, you see this with the ha House Representatives, members of the, uh, in Olympia, members in Washington, D.C. They come from specific communities and they work together, not passing laws for their specific district, but passing laws for the entire community or the nation or state. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Any other comments from the boardroom? 
All right, seeing none, Mr. Garrett, do we have anybody online? Mr. Garrett indicates we have nobody online that would like to comment. So we'll close the audience comments and next we'll I apologize, Mr. Lehrman, we do have one comment. Who do we have? All right, our commenter is going to be Christy Grimm. Christy Grimm, your mi microphone is unmuted. Great, thank you so much. Good evening, Vice President Lehrman, Superintendent Whitney, and members of the board. I am Christy Grimm, I'm a teacher in the district, and I am coming to you tonight to talk about the sub shortage. Um, as you may well be aware, we are heavily impacted by the lack of subs and people having to sub during their prep to cover classes. I know, for example, one building was out eight subs last week. So I would really like our district to look at what we can do to increase our subs and then also look at the impacts that our calendar would have on the sub shortage. For example, this year, we are off November 11th for Veterans Day. The 12th is a Friday and there's school. Many people are already gone. On the 29th, which is a Monday, the Monday after Thanksgiving, we um, have school and a trimester break day is on Tuesday the 30th. Again, greatly impacting our subs and our buildings because people will be gone. I've heard at one building that they did an anonymous survey, 20% of their staff may be gone on those days. So we really need to take a look at smart calendaring and doing what's best for our kids. I would propose the district and the board request or the board request a cost impact analysis for the lack of subs and the cost it is to the district to pay us at our per diem rate to sub. And then also the learning loss impact. If teach students are getting five to six to seven, eight different people in their room a day that makes it very challenging to have a cohesive education. So I'm asking for you to look at the sub situation and please help us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Grimm. Do we have anybody else online? We have no more commenters, Mr. Lerman. All right, thank you, Mr. Garrett. So we will now close audience comments and we'll move on to approval of the uh, meeting minutes from October 26, 2021. I would entertain a motion. Mr. Vice President, I move that we approve the regular meeting minutes for October 26, 2021. I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. Uh, those in favor, please say yes. 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 Those opposed, no. All right, motion carries. We'll move on to the consent agenda. On the consent agenda, we have personnel, warrants, out of state and overnight student travel for Chihuahua High School Ski Club program to attend the Mount Bachelor Ski Resort in Bend, Oregon. We have out of state and overnight student travel for Chihuahua High School Ski Club to attend Mount Bachelor Ski Resort in Bend, Oregon. We have three of these, another out of state overnight student travel for Chihuahua High School Ski Club program to attend Schweitzer Ski Resort in Sand Point, Idaho. And that is what we have on the consent agenda tonight. I will entertain a motion. I move to uh, approve the consent agenda as presented. I second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Richardson, please call the roll. Yes. 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 All right. Thank you. We'll move on to agenda item number nine. We have action items. So the first action item we have tonight is resolution number 1010, a request for a special session of the legislator, um, a resolution that we talked about uh, at our last board meeting. So we have Ms. Sarah Thornton here. Good evening, uh, Vice President Lehrman, uh, members of the board, and Superintendent Whitney. Resolution 1010 requests a special session of the legislature in response to the uh, continued state of emergency regarding COVID-19. 
as a board, you had a discussion about this resolution, uh, which w was developed at the request of the board. Uh, you discussed it at the last meeting, and the change from the last meeting, based on your input, was that uh, we added in the third paragraph a reference to the impact to public school districts so that the resolution could be connected to the work of the uh, school, or so that the uh, language and the concerns regarding the state of emergency could be linked to the work of the school districts. And this is presented to you uh, for your consideration and action this evening at the request of Mr. Christensen. All right, thank you, Ms. Thornton. Any questions for Ms. Thornton from the board? Any discussion from the board or the, or the student representatives? Okay, I would entertain a motion. So, Mr. President, I move to approve resolution number 1010 as presented. I second. So, we have a motion and a second. Is there additional discussion by the board? Yeah, so, fellow board members, I asked for this uh, resolution to be drafted because I'm because of the impact that these, uh, that the governor's mandates have had on public education. We're all wearing masks, both in this room, at schools, and, um, and we are also, our staff has all had to be vaccinated or leave the district. And so I think these things have impacted us as, a, as an educational system, impact us in our society today. Um, I don't dispute the fact that the governor has the authority to make these declarations or these, these mandates under the Emergency Powers Act of the state of Washington. So I, I, that's not the purpose of the re resolution. The, the intent of this revolution, or resolution is to ask the governor to bring the people's elected representatives back into session if he wants to continue this so-called emergency that we are uh, experiencing or started out. I think it was legitimate in the beginning, but I think for him to continue this uh, without the input from the people's elected representatives is a, is a, is a big ask for him. So I, I would ask that we as a district send a notice to him to say, Mr. Governor, Please call the people's elected representatives back into session and get their input instead of acting um, independently of them. So that's the reason for this resolution and this request for a special session. It is, is, it is within his authority to do that, to bring the people back in and get, get the vote of the people or get the, votes, the uh, vote of the legislature if he wants to continue this. So. That's, uh, that's the reason I asked for this. We've had discussion on it now. Last time, there was one request for an amendment to add the, just the tie between this resolution and school districts, and so hence that language has been added. Any other discussion? So we discussed this, like Mr. Christensen said, as a board last time. The red language there is the only thing that was changed. There was discussion on talking about whether or not there were impacts to children's education. We decided against that language. This language here says that, that they've impacted public school districts. I think we can safely say that measures have administratively impacted every organization, every business, every, everything across the state. So that, that language is in there. And uh, like Mr. Christensen said, this isn't questioning the legality of where we are, but we've been in, in this uh, mode for over a year. Uh, most things that we said as a government do have sunsets or do have durations, this doesn't. So this request is to get the legislators who gave the emergency power to them at the start of this a chance to get back together and, and rediscuss. 
Any other discussion? All right. So with that, I'll, um, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Richardson, please call the roll. Yes. 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 All right, motion carries. We'll move on to action item B. We have uh, resolution number 1011, the expiring educational programs and operational levies discussion. And we have Mr. Kevin Hebden here. Good evening, Vice President Learman, members of the board, Superintendent Whitney. Before you tonight uh, in your board packet was um, a resolution, resolution number 1011. talking about the expiring uh, levy. We just came out of a uh, study session, board study session previously, 4.30 to 5.30 this evening. Uh, reminder of, of the journey you've been on as a board, and again, I expressed my appreciation then, and I'll do it again uh, here in this environment. Uh, truly appreciate the work that you've done and and this is where we're at um, purpose of this resolution is to replace uh, replacement of the expiring educational programs and operations levy and district seeks action on uh, the amounts and estimated rates in preparation uh, for a February 8th, 2022 ballot measure. The amounts as we've discussed, uh, term amounts and estimated levy rate per thousand of assessed value are there on the screen. There are also uh, the associated fiscal year as a school district operates on a uh, non-calendar year. Uh, these different levy amounts will feather into the school uh, calendar school year um, amounts. And uh, we've got our AV growth over the four years as estimated there. The process, oh, I, I need to, uh, I need to introduce with you, uh, and he'll be a part of this presentation potentially later on is Lee Marquisio is with us with uh, Foster Garvey and they've assisted the district in uh, drafting the resolution, drafting uh, statements, explanatory statements and making sure that we are in compliance with all of the election laws and requirements in, in moving this process forward. One new item uh, new to this board not necessarily new this year, but new to this board. In the time since the time you passed the last levy, oh, there is a uh, new requirement that OSPI approve our. Um, there's a, a, a pre-ballot approval process, and on here, this you can see it. Uh, I know it's really small. It's not necessarily the detail there, but just wanted to bring you uh, bring to your attention this new requirement. Once we set the levy amounts and estimated rates, we will send this off to OSPI. The requirement is that this is approved prior to uh, the um, voter uh, ballots are, are mailed out. As I mentioned, uh, Foster Garvey, uh, Lee Marquisio, and Jim McNeil both uh, were instrumental in, in helping us develop our explanatory statements. What will we use the funding for? And uh, that was included in your, your board packets. Uh, with, with, the, with the resolution, I uh, just wanted to show you here the ballot measure, measure, measure resolution cover sheet talks about um, who, who, who we are, um, who our attorney is, the, um, the various details of our replacement, uh, expiring educational programs and operations levy, who their contact information is at the county, uh, being myself and uh, Mr. McNeil. 
the first couple of pages of the resolution are, are here, just uh, listing the amounts, the four-year period, and the anticipated levy or estimated levy rates. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, Lee Marquisio is here. If you have any questions about the legal aspects or the specific details of the resolution, um, he could answer any of those questions that you might have. Um, I would turn it back to you for uh, discussion. I've got a suggested motion on the screen when that time is right for you as a board to entertain. And uh, I, I turn it back to you, Vice President Learman. Thank you, Mr. Hebb, and thank you, as you saw on the first slide there, to all the hard work and all the sessions that you've had with us, um, both as a board and as individual board members. We appreciate the time that you and your team put in and consideration for this. Is there any questions for Mr. Hebden from the board? Seeing no questions, I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Vice President. I move to approve resolution number 1011, replacement of expiring educational programs and operation levy as presented. I'll second the motion. So we have a motion and a second. Is there additional discussion or questions from the board? Student board sure. reps. I want to just uh, make a comment. So we had, um, we had one of our constituents here today and it, it in full disclosure, I know, I know him very well. I've known him since we first moved into the community. And I, I think he speaks for a part of our community that is, that, that we may think doesn't have any interest in schools because he doesn't have children in school anymore. He, he probably has grandkids in school. I don't know if he has any here in our district. But um, there are many in our community who are on fixed incomes for whom this will be a, you know, an added burden um, having said that, prices are going up everywhere, and, and to think that the school district is going to continue to operate on the same amount of money is, uh, is it just doesn't happen, doesn't work. Um, you know, it would be nice if we had enough growth that we didn't have to pay more money in taxes, but unfortunately it doesn't work that way. Uh, taxes or costs go up, the way we pay for them is with taxes, and so I think it just... I mean, I, I feel for all of us as a community, taxes go up. Unfortunately, as a district, we're not like the corner gas station where if they, their prices are too high, they can just lower a little bit and, uh, and, and increase their business. They can make adjustments as needed. With this levy, this is a four-year commitment, and it's hard to project out there four years and see exactly what's going to happen. But... Um, we're asking for a four-year levy to dollar seventy-five. That is a bit of an increase from where we've been at a dollar fifty. But I, I think this is something that, as a as a as a district, we need. And I I think it's I, I think we've done as well as we can in assessing what the need is going to be, keeping it fair, and keeping it uh, reasonable, and not putting us in jeopardy. So I, I think it's it's time to make a decision and move forward with this and I would recommend that all of my fellow board members support this this levy as presented by Mr. Hebden and, and the district staff. Any other discussion from the board? Um, yeah, Scott, can I, can you guys hear me? Go ahead, Miss President Phillips. Um, yeah, I, this is part of the reason I got on, even though I'm not feeling well, but I feel like this is really important. One of the things is that we are, we are in competition with, for our employees with Ken Oak and Richland. And, um, and even if we don't want it to be that way, there is a limited amount of labor. And it's really important that we stay in competition. Right now, Richland is at nearly a dollar. Um, right now, as it stands, it, they're about, they're, um, they're exactly double what we are if we kept our levy at the same. So they're getting double the money and for every cent that they pass, they actually get more money than we do because they have higher assessed values. That's really hard to compete with our employees with other districts. 
Kennewick isn't quite as as weighted that way, but it is still weighted. Um, I, I was there, by, by the way, I was listening via um, YouTube earlier and heard all of the all of the things. I really appreciate the data. I really appreciate Mr. Hebden for answering my questions so completely. So thank you for that. Um, the other thing too is our administrative costs are very low compared to our neighboring districts. Um, another thing is a lot of industry is coming. We know that there is that we are increasing more than 10% in the next four years just in industry, which will help take that tax burden off our our local people. Um, and and as we look back through the last 10 years, the tax rate has dropped um, by about half. Now our our assessed values have doubled, so it it has or a little bit more than doubled. So taxes haven't necessarily gone down, but our tax rates have dropped. We've dropped in, in more than one area because of the increased number of people. Um, and, and then what is approved by the voters, almost always we collect less than what's approved by the voters because we're growing so much. You know, I don't want to raise taxes. I don't like to raise taxes, but I also realize we are gonna have a really hard time when Kennewick and Richland are pass, passing double the levy amounts or close to double the levy amounts that we are. We are conservative. We are more conservative in almost every way than Pasco and Richland, but we do need to make sure that we can competitively pay our teachers. We have had a windfall of money, and um, but that money is ha has been earmarked for very specific purposes and it will be going away. And so we cannot rely on that money to, to continue to pay our employees competitive wages and continue to keep our, our um, curriculum updated and, and all of the things that, that levy money helps us do. So I really believe that we need to pass this levy. Thank you, President Phillips. Any other comments, questions from the board? So we've, we've uh, talked about this. If we go to the front slide, you can see all the dates if you're interested in seeing the board discussion, the history of of what the board has said as a whole, what, what the district has presented to us, what board members have said as individuals. Um, in the end, yeah, I, you can listen to what I've said in other meetings. Um, it's somewhat in line with, I don't know Mr. Rose who was here, never met him before. What he said, my concerns are that when we look at our projections um, for high assessed values on increases on individual properties over the next few years, even if we pass a dollar fifty, that is a, a pretty significant increase. Um, whether it's a dollar fifty or a dollar seventy-five, either one's a significant increase on our taxpayers. In addition, with the bond that that we hope to pass, um, so my non-support of, of this dollar seventy-five has nothing to do with my support of of the levy as a whole, as levies as a whole, as bonds as a whole, or of the district's work in showing us as a board what we what we uh need to pass but i don't i don't believe that we should raise the rate at this time with all of the unknowns and with all the other changes that we have so any other questions or comments from the board all right we have a motion and a second on the table uh, miss richardson please call the roll yes no yes yes Yes. All right, motion carries. Thank you again, Mr. Hebden. Thank you to the district. Thank you to everyone who put in hard work researching this, the fellow board members that put in hard work researching it. And thank you in advance to our community for consideration of this uh, levy. And let's uh, hope that it passes. And we appreciate all of the support from our community. Thank you. All right, next we will move on to action item C, appointment of the pro-con committee for voters guide. Thank you board members, I appreciate your support and uh, appreciate the decision. Uh, before you tonight, we have uh, kind of a formality uh, requirement. Our purpose tonight is to appoint uh, citizens to the pro and con committees to write uh, for and against statements for the Franklin County Local Voters Pamphlet related to the Pasco School District's replacement of e uh, expiring EP&O levy ballot measure 
to be considered on February 8th, 2022. The work we've done is, is advertising the local paper on a district website and soliciting citizens to serve on the pro-con committees uh, in compliance with um, requirements uh, and, and law. We've uh, received some uh, responsive uh, citizens and they'll be in the resolution uh, to, or excuse me, they'll be in the action item to be appointed to the, to the committee. And uh, this is the form that we fill out and provide it with uh, to the Franklin County um, auditors, the election department. And with, with that, I have a, a suggested motion on, on the screen there for you and just would put out a little caveat at the bottom there. Um, we are not requesting action for appointment of citizens to the con committee as after published uh, notice, no citizens expressed an interest in that committee. So I turn it back to you, uh, Vice President Learman. Thank you, Mr. Hebden. Any questions from the board? I'd entertain a motion. Mr. Vice President, for the purpose of writing statements for Franklin County's Voters Guide, I move to appoint Aaron Richardson, Brian Kreutz, and Hillary Kreutz to the Pro Committee advocating approval of the district's February 8th, 2022 levy measure. A second. We have a motion and a second on the table. Is there any board discussion? All right, hearing none, Ms. Richardson, please call the roll. Yes. 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 All right, thank you. That, uh, you, you got some more there for us, us Mr. Hepton? Yeah, just real quick, a reminder of our timeline moving forward as uh, December 10th is our filing deadline. We'll get this information put together in the appropriate forms and fashion, working with um, Foster, or uh, yeah, Foster Garvey, and uh, um, Jim McNeil. Appreciate um, Lee Marquisio being here with us tonight. I believe he might be playing a role later on as well. Um, and that's, that's our, our time frame moving forward. So thank you again this evening. Appreciate all your work. All right, thank you, Mr. Hebden. That concludes our action items. Next we have reports. Uh, first step, report A is the curriculum material adoption update for English and language arts. And we have Ms. Carla Lobos here. Vice President Lerman, Superintendent Whitney, members of the board, it's my pleasure to be with you this evening to provide you with an update on our adoption of new curriculum materials for English language arts for kinder through fifth grade. So as part of our process, which is also outlined in our contract with our association, there is a selection of staff and parents, community members, for participation on the committee. This year we had a great deal of interest from our parents and community and all that were interested that could meet the timelines in the meeting schedule were invited to participate. So these are the breakdown of our teachers who are currently on that committee for English language arts and our parents and community members. The process is comprised of committee selection, pre-screener development, and through the pre-screener, a narrowing of materials to three, and then a deep analysis of those three materials by the committee. At the same time, the three materials will be delivered to the buildings for stakeholder input. Finally, 
the committee completes their analysis that includes a state bias screener and makes their final recommendations to the Instructional Materials Committee, and then the IMC will make their final recommendations to the board for adoption. The committee selected the following components as part of the pre-screening process, and through this process, we have narrowed the materials to four, which currently are ARC, which is American Reading Company, My View, My Vision, 2020, Wonders or Maravillas, 2020, and Into Reading, Arriba la Lectura, 2020. These four publishers will be invited to present an overview of their materials, and the committee will eliminate one additional program, leaving the total to three. And they actually just completed that last night. <laughs> Once the materials are narrowed to three, the committee will conduct a deep analysis of the materials, their alignment to the standards, the balanced literacy framework, and differentiation for special groups and populations. We will be using the IMET rubric, which is an instructional materials evaluation tool, to conduct the deep analysis of the materials. As the committee is working on the evaluation of the respective programs, samples of each of the of materials will be delivered to buildings by January 15th. All the work will be completed prior to March 15th with a recommendation on a final program to the IMC. And then by April 15th, a final recommendation will be made to the board by the IMC for formal adoption. all I have if there are any questions. Thank you, Ms. Lobos. Any questions from the board or the student representatives for Ms. Lobos? Thank you, Ms. Lobos. I've got a, just a couple of questions. So this is for 2022, right? I mean, it, it looks like the timeline is... It will be for next school year. We'll be implementing these materials next year. Yeah, yeah that's what I meant. Yes. 2022, 23. Thank mm -hmm. you. And then, um, so these standards, when you talk about aligning with the sta state standards, is that part of this rubric then? So that's determined by the, the teachers, basically, that, are, that will be using it? Yes, yeah, so what we do, and the standards are Washington State Learning Standards, and what we do is we take the rubric. So what they will do is there's a selection, and we've already done some work um, as a district to identify essential learning standards at every grade level and the ones that are most important. So what they will do is they will select one of those essential standards and look at it in each of the programs and then compare. And so they're looking at usability. Is the standard taught completely? Um, is it in the resources? Are there modifications for special groups and populations? Um, are there assessments that align to those standards? So they will select some standards and they'll use that IMET rubric in each of the publishing materials that are available. Okay. So this is something we make the determination. It's not the publisher saying, yeah, we meet Washington State standards or OSPI saying these are the approved curricula. It's something that, w that, that our committee actually does themselves. Our committee will go through to analyze using specific standards, yes, but we also look at other resources like to get to this point with this pre-screener. Pre there are lots of nonprofit organization in other states that have done the work. Um, and so we use a lot of that data just to narrow it to the ones that are that meet the standards. And then we will go through when you're looking at a narrowing of the three into a deep analysis where we're actually going through and doing it ourselves. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, seeing no other questions, we'll thank you, Ms. Lobos. We will move on to report B. We have outrageous outcomes for social emotional learning. The category is meaningful connection and hope, and we have Ms. Mira Gobel here. Later, I can't see very well. Good evening, um, Vice President Learman and members of the board, um, Superintendent Whitney. It is our pleasure to share with you, continue to share our progress monitoring around our outrageous outcomes. Um, and this evening, I have my colleague, 
um, director who, uh, of student supports, um, uh, Ms. Alice Amaya, who's gonna be presenting with me. So, um, so the, the outrageous outcomes that we're gonna share with you today is our fifth outrageous outcome, which is 100% of our students uh, will um, make meaningful connections and have hope for their future. And this outrageous outcome was sort of refreshed a couple of years ago. And since then, we have been developing some benchmarking and what kind of data that we should be collecting to really measure what I call is sort of a gauzier data. It's not like literacy or mathematics that, that we need to, it's more complex data that we should be, um, we'll be sharing with you tonight. So as you can see, the indicators, um, the data that we're gonna share with you, there are um, a few of them. We're gonna be looking at our CEE data, which is a student perception data um, that we'll share with you. Um, and also we're gonna be sharing data from 2019, actually it's 1819 Health Youth Survey. There are some questions that it, it connects to um, our fifth outrageous outcome. We also wanna look at students' absenteeism. Um, when students feel belong, they're gonna be in school. So the absenteeism and looking at that attendance data is actually critical to see how students feel belong and um, actually having meaningful connection to school, as well as discipline data and um, specifically athletics and extracurricular and activities. When students, um, they're connected beyond the, the school, the classrooms uh, um, that we know that they are more connected um, and actually gonna be thriving in school. So those are some of the indicator data that we wanna share with you. So before I just jump into the data, I wanna do some context setting. Um, the so social emotional learning data is complex. And I love this quote that I actually shared this with principals a couple of um, weeks ago when we were talking about attendance data, that for, the, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. So when there's a complex problem, it is really important that we sort of unpack it and get to the root causes of that rather than jumping to the problem solving based on first assumption or what it looks like from the outside. So social emotional learning data is complex. Also trying to quantify perceptual and behavior data is also complex. Um, so when developing solutions to complex problems, taking the time to identify root causes is critical. So I was trying to think of an analogy, I'm an analogy person to understand complex problem, is like when I go to the doctor with an ailment, um, usually they collect a bunch of data before they actually get to why I'm there. Um, the very first set of data is that I step on a scale and they measure my height. Usually those data, I'm not surprised by that. Rarely am I say, that is not what it says in my driver's license. That can't be my right, that, that, you right? So those are, I would say, compared to more literacy and mathematics data. However, when I go into the doctor's office, they give me my blood pressure. Now that's complex. I don't fully understand it. But question is not, okay, how is my neighbor doing with the blood pressure? I compare to, is this normal for me? Um, is this where I should be? Or oh, I know it's high because I ran here. I mean, there are some reasons as to why my blood pressure is as it is. That's more complex data. The data that we're about to share with you, I would say is more complex that way. That, so I use a word like gauzy data. It's not straight, so we need to think about um, all, the, all the root causes of it. So, um, we believe, however, this outrageous, outrageous outcome is key to academic success. When students feel connected, when they feel belong, um, they're gonna come to school and they're gonna engage in meaningful learning. So we believe that, that this is a really an important um, data set for us to continue to monitor. So the very first set of data, one of the data that we'll consider um, is a, a, the Student Educational Effectiveness Survey, EES which is formative and diagnostic tool that helps districts and schools to discover students' perception and attitudes toward feeling hopeful, having a sense of belonging, and getting social emotional support. Um, the survey data provides really actionable information to key stakeholders to inform decision making and help build collaborative school cultures and um, facilitate student learning. The 65 question survey is administered annually to Pasco School students in grades four through 12 um, it, and is administered annually. And it's a three year data that we'll be looking at. Um, the end number has been between six to 7,000 students who participated each year. Um, we did not administer this survey in 2019 and 20 because of COVID. 
Um, the youth development uh, for education results work group in Washington really developed the student engagement and motivation and 21st century skills survey items based on the research about student motivation and engagement and the skills and dispositions that matter most to school success. And that's what um, you're seeing in this. These are the categories that they had developed. Um, so out of these, the two that I think is most relevant to our outrageous outcomes is the future orientation and belonging and identity. And those are the two indicators that we'll be looking at. Those two we, we feel that measures really student agency, um, self-efficacy, and sense of belonging and perception for their future. Um, we can make inferences that when students feel hopeful about their future um, and have this agency to influence their trajectory of their own future, they are more likely to find school relevant. Um, the work group really distilled it down to the seven skills and dispositions that measure students' social emotional well-being and the indicators closely align to our fifth outrageous outcomes, our future orientation and the belonging um, to their future. And so this is our data. This is overall data. This graph that you see um, is all the, the seven dispositions and um, uh, the skills that I've mentioned, except for the two that I'm gonna, the two indicators that we'll be looking at closely. As you can see, um, that there is a dip from 2017-18 when we first administered this test or survey to our students. Um, there was a, a slight dip and then, but it increased last spring when students returned to school. Um, specifically, the one that it had the most increase is really collaboration and interpersonal skills. That's one of those I think we can make inferences. They've been learning from home, away from their friends and they're back to school and I could see why that um, data was much higher than the others. Is the data only taken in the spring? We do once a year in the spring, yes. And which students, all students? All students, grades four through 12. And they take it during the school day or yes. online at yeah. home? They, they do it during the school day, yeah. So the two specific indicators that we're going to be looking at, the following two indicators specifically address the outrageous outcome, the fifth outrageous outcome that we've been talking about. The survey statements for these indicators are questions like the students answered, I am hopeful about my future. I know I will graduate from high school. I have a plan for what I want to do after high school. I'm good at staying focused on my goals. So those are the questions the students answered for future orientation. Um, other statements for belonging and identity. I feel good about my cultural or ethnic background. There is at least one adult in school that I can talk to if I have a problem. I feel proud of my school. In my school, I feel that I belong to a group of friends. Um, this school has effective equity practices for all. What we see is a composite data of the, those two indicators. Um, the steep slopes are actually somewhat misleading because they're actually 1% um, the increments. So however, the future orientation decline um, by 3% from 2017, 18 to 2021. Um, with almost a year of distance learning in the midst. Belonging and identity, however, increased by 2% during the same time span. Our kids are resilient, and that's one of the things that I'm always in awe of our students and their resilience. Um, they will, we believe that data will, um, this co will collect it this coming spring. I think will be a really reliable baseline data from you know, we don't know the impact of the pandemic in the social emotional learning of our students. So I think the data that we'll be collecting this year is gonna give us a good baseline. Yeah, it's just, it's counterintuitive for most parents and people who had kids at home to go, kids feel more included in 2021 than 2018 or 19, you know, cause less kids were participating in band and choir and clubs and sports and when they did get to go back to school, even in the spring, they didn't get to talk as much. There was right. more social distancing. So it's just a, it's interesting to look at and go, or is it the same baseline or did they drop so low in 2020 that any amount of tiny, tiny social interaction <laughs> sprung them up pretty high there? That, you know, those are very possible. Uh, but I'm really surprised if you look at this data 
there is a very little change. I know it looks steep in the slope, but you know, going from 78% to really 75%, that surprises me. I thought it would dip, dip lower than that. I think that's what you were saying. So this data actually just, is surprising. It's qualitative data or it's how you feel, if we could actually quantify it and how much time did you actually spend with other students and right. interacting, it has to be smaller in 2021 than you know, 2018, 19. So the 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 feel right. is is just it sprung up so much just by getting a little bit of interaction. That's interesting yeah. to see. You know that 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 you know that I think that's why I was saying this kind of that gauzy data, perceptual data is really interesting to you know, going back to the doctor when they say you know rate your pay, pain scale. You know, I want to say ten, but I don't want to be whim, so I'm going to say five. I mean, so so it varies. So you know, so when you report that there is a lot of variability variables about as to why we report. So perceptual data are definitely uh, more complex to interpret. If you just went through trauma, it's right. going to be a lot different. A lot what, different. How you feel. So um, the other data that I'm going to share with you is, you know, kind of going back to what you're saying, um, Mr. Lehrman, around we know when students are connected through extracurricular activities, athletics, and clubs, um, that that creates sense of belonging. They connect with, you know, other adults other than teachers. So in February 2019, a new way of tracking extracurricular data through power schools was implemented um, in effort to collect more robust data around students participating in various extracurricular, co-curricular activities, um, categories like um, clubs and service and visual, visual performing arts. Um, the, this data tracking system has not been utilized with consistency these past two years. We launched it and then COVID hit the month after. Um, so I would say the only the data that we have that that I have to share with you is a high school athletics data. I mean to your comparison. Um, so as you can see from this data by and it's really divide uh, disaggregated divided subgroups of students. And as you can anticipate, there is a significant decrease of student groups participating in athletics and um, in high school athletics. If we had a data for clubs and other extracurricular activities, my guess would be the data would be very similar um, for many reasons. There was a lot of restrictions and protocols that students had to follow to participate and that also was a, was a barrier to participating in extracurricular activities. So um, before I turn it over to Ms. Samaya, are there any questions that I can, I can answer for you? Any questions from the board? Student board reps? And I'll come back at the end. All right. She's going to share ahead. next year. Just one observation. <coughs> the, uh, so do you, do you have any idea why, I mean, every indicator that you've shown us in 2018-19 went down. And all of them but one went up again, which I think, you know, we, we talked about. But what happened in 18-19 that, any idea what caused it to go down if we, and I can speak to that. We had one of our comprehensive high schools take the Center for Educational Effectiveness survey for the first time. So, um, you know, it was a large N of students who hadn't been represented in the data in the past who took it. Okay. Was okay. one of the factors that it, we believe influenced that, that data pretty significantly. So 17, 18 was a, a just a, a, not a completely different group, but a significantly different group than the 18, 19 group which took it. Thank you. For that, that. Thank you for that comment. That's helpful. Good evening, Vice President Lehrman and board members. So our next indicator uses data from the Healthy Youth Survey. The Healthy Youth Survey is a collaborative effort between OSPI and several other state level departments. The Healthy Youth Survey provides important information about the health of adolescents in Washington that helps guide policy and programs that serve youth. The Healthy Youth Survey was first administered in the state of Washington in the early 2000s with administrations occurring every two years for students in grades 6, 8, 10, and 12. The questions on the survey have changed over time to stay relevant to students' interests and experiences. For example, in 2006, they discontinued a question 
asking about whether students wore helmets when rollerblading. Beginning with the 2018 administration, the Healthy Youth Survey began incorporating items from the Children's Hope Scale, which is an instrument that measures the level of hope in individuals ages 8 to 16. These items were included in the Healthy Youth Survey because research has linked hope with overall physical, psychological, and social well-being. The four specific survey items used to generate the composite score in the graph shown include the following. I can think of many ways to get the things in life that are most important to me. When I have a problem, I can come up with lots of ways to solve it. I am doing just as well as other kids my age. And I think the things I have done in the past will help me in the future. Based on our 2018 data, most students reported experiencing high levels of hope, with all three grade levels scoring between 42 and 50%. Between 24% and 31% of surveyed students indicated that they were moderately hopeful, 19 to 20% indicated they were slightly hopeful, and 6 to 8% indicated that they had very little or no hope. While this data helps us understand what our students' hope for the future was like three years ago, it does not reflect the significant behavioral health impact resulting from the global pandemic with exacerbating social, emotional, and behavioral and mental health needs, we would hypothesize that this data might have changed. Currently, our middle and high school students are participating in the 2020 Healthy Youth Survey Administration that was postponed last year due to COVID. This current administration will provide us with a more accurate baseline data for this indicator, and we are expecting these results later this year. Do you have any questions? Our next indicator relates to student absenteeism. Attendance is a critical building block for student learning. When students are not present at school, they cannot engage in the learning process. This indicator specifically looks at student data where the rate of absenteeism is greater than 10%, which is also referred to as chronic absenteeism. So when we're looking at a full 180 day school year, this equates to missing 18 days or more of instruction. All student groups experienced an increase in the percentage of students meeting the criteria for chronic absenteeism from the 2019-2020 to the 2020-2021 school year, with an overall student population increasing from 20.4 to 38.7%. Many student groups experienced significant changes, with some approximately doubling their rate of chronic absenteeism. The most impacted group in our system included our migrant students. This data may also indicate that the COVID-19 pandemic significantly impacted student attendance and consequently student engagement in learning. While these trends are comparable to other districts in our region, we are dedicated to continuing to remove barriers to help improve attendance and engagement in school, particularly for our most vulnerable and marginalized students. So did did the 2019-2020 data, when we were home from March through June, would would there have been absenteeism during that time, or did we keep did we keep rolling every class? Would that data be in in the red data there? Our codes were a little bit different during that time. We had um, we had remote we had some like remote engage remote excuse types of codes but this would include all of the absences. So, so even, even if they were excused absence, remote absence, this would just be our absenteeism as a total. I'm trying to remember what we even did from March to June. Were we doing <laughs> some version of remote school and we were taking roles? So some, there would be some of it baked into there because some people wouldn't have been able to get online and, or wouldn't have, okay. So the red, the 2019 to 20 data, if we were to put the previous year before it, was it trending up already because of the end of the year COVID impacts? I would have to look back specifically at that data to, to answer that okay. accurately. Um, All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, I do have a question. Yeah. Are, um, are students who drop out included in this data 
So this would be enrolled students. So after a student has been absent for a certain number of days, they would not be included in this data set. Any other questions? Okay. So this indicator is related to student discipline and it looks at trends in the percentage of students receiving suspensions and expulsions. This report reflects a significant decrease in exclusionary di discipline in all student groups between the 1920 and 2021 school years. In 2019-2020, students attended school in person for approximately seven months before moving to virtual learning for the remainder of the school year. In the 2020-2021 school year, students attended school in virtual or blended settings for more than eight months and resume full in-person learning during the last two months of the school year. The decrease in exclusionary discipline can be attributed to the significant reduction of in-person learning that occurred during the 2020-21 school year in comparison to typical years. So while it's not reported um, above, data from the 2018-2019 school year is the most recent full uh, data set that we have related to student behavior and discipline. However, as mentioned before, the 2018-2019 data doesn't reflect the significant behavioral health impact that has occurred as a result of COVID. We're expecting that the 2021-2022 behavior and discipline data will be the true baseline for this indicator. Do we have any feel for if, if uh, exclusionary discipline is increased or decreased to our kids more likely to have outbursts in class now that we have social distancing or mask is it the same or is it actually less are they less likely to do that do we have any gut feel there or data for a gut feel i i mean i think that you know in terms of narratives around around student i think we've had a significant increase in social emotional needs which often can reflect behavior um Again, I would need to pull a comparison to, act, to answer that accurately, but just as a result of COVID and the stress and all of you know, some of those internalizing issues that students and families have experienced, we feel that. I mean, that's a very real thing. Yeah. Um, and so that's, you know, this is, that kind of gives a little bit of a segue into, you know, into to some of our systems that we're continuing to build in support of this strategic yeah. uh, priority and outrageous outcome. Well, some kids might that used to have outbursts might go into a shell, and other kids may have more discipline. But is there a quick is there a quick database to look in for the district to look at how many exclusionary discipline activities there were for the first two months of this year versus two months of twenty nineteen twenty? Yes, we'll yes, person. we have access to all of that data. Okay, if it's of interest, um, send it to the board. If it, thank you. Any other questions? So with that, our strategic priority supporting the outrageous outcome is multi-tiered systems of support for social emotional learning and behavior. It's also referred to as MTSS SEB, this framework involves a three-tiered preventative model for providing all students access to a continuum of evidence-based supports and interventions specifically designed to meet their needs. When implemented with fidelity, we can expect improvements in social, emotional, behavioral, and academic outcomes. Additionally, MTSS SEB facilitates positive school social culture and helps increase student connection to the learning environment. So the district has also prioritized um, and really investing in numerous resources um, that support the social, emotional, and behavior needs of all students at Pasco School District. Um, and so what you see here is resources include staffing and professional development and coaching in various extracurricular or curricular resources targeting social emotional competencies um, for students um, as well as uh, teachers. And so 
These are a number of additional resources as counselors, behavior innovation specialists, and nurses, and we also have communities and school um, in our schools as well. These are just additional bodies that who can connect with students for that meaningful connection. Um, and this next slide um, really represents the additional resources that we have provided at the secondary level. Um, additionally, the Pasco school, school District has established a community partnership with mental health agencies um, and, pro, um, and providers to help provide ongoing therapeutic supports to our students with um, intensive needs. And if you think about, you know, uh, we had many conversations, if you think about our current freshmen, the last time they were in school really full time, you know, as normal as can be, they were in seventh grade. So the, those, tr those, those um, really um, intentional transitions that, that we do as students move through schools um, that we have not been able to provide to the, uh, the way that we have in the past. So, um, you know, we are seeing those impacts and I would be happy to provide those additional data, um, what we see so far. So some of the next steps, um, we are going to relaunch that extracurricular and athletics, that data dashboard that we've talked about so we can collect more accurate um, data around students um, involved in extracurricular activities and clubs. Um, so we're also doing a lot of analysis of our, this, this gauzy complex data. Um, and so um, identify really root causes, not making quick, you know, um, assumptions about why students are not coming to school or in this, as you can see, these data also impacts their academic achievement as well. So we're engaged in data analysis um, to identify some potential solutions. Um, we also continue to calibrate the MTSS SEB as um, Samaya talked about, the implementation across all schools and the powers in the refinement. So we need to continue to refine um, and also explore additional resources and professional development for our educators. So, those are some next steps. So that is all we have for you tonight. Any questions, um, comments? Questions or comments from the board? I actually do have a couple comments. Um, I was on the advisory council when this um, outrageous outcome was coming to get changed. It changed about two years ago, three yeah, years ago? Years ago. Um, yeah. And so one of the things that uh, was brought up is because this used to be 100% uh, of students will, uh, I think, is be involved in extracurriculars. And I think something that we um, kind of mentioned and recognized is that when we changed this to having hope, it wasn't going to be as qualitative. It wasn't going to be as straightforward data. And I just wanted everyone to know, especially the board, that we can do as many tests, we can run as many of these as we want, we can do as many uh, questionnaires, all this stuff, but you're not going to really get a good gauge of this because really it's more for the students, it's more for them to see this on a poster and not just see data, 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 to see something that actually means something to them. And there's so many different ways you can quali quantify hope and you can define it. I mean, I'm sure if you asked everyone in this room, they'd have a different de definition of hope. And um, also to talk about one of these slides, uh, I think it was slide number eight uh, with the high school athletic participation decrease. Um, I think that's just something that's kind of, I think it's getting redefined as you don't need to be in athletics to be cool, to be all this stuff. I think people are recognizing that they can do walking at home, they can do exercise at home and they don't need to be in all the athletics anymore. So I think it's just that we're evolving and not necessarily that we're decreasing. Um, and I'm sure if you ran the test to see how many people were in extracurriculars uh, clubs, that that would be increasing as well because I think we're recognizing that hope and being connected doesn't necessarily mean athletics anymore. It just means talking with your friends and having a good time, so yeah. That's all I had to say. Yeah. Jennifer, you are very wise to say that, and I agree with you. It is a complex data, but it's really an important data that we need to continue to identify additional indicators to measure, because it's really about the student agency. Mm -hmm. I call it the inside out transformation, right? And so when you can see yourself going somewhere, then most likely you will. So I think it is really important 
outrageous outcome for us to continue to monitor. So um, thank you for your wise words. As always. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, for speaking up there. I, I, this, is, this, is, uh, this is interesting information. And it's, you know, when you talk about reading, writing, rith arithmetic, math, science, and so forth, this is not that, right? This, right. Is, this is measuring something completely different, but, but uh, equally important in many respects. If our, if our kids don't have hope, then, then we've got some real challenges. And so thank you for measuring this and it, as much as you can and finding these ways to do this. I think it's, uh, it's very informative for us as a board to know this type of information. You know, it was an interesting change a, a couple of years ago when we made this. It, knowing that we were going from something that we could measure that, 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 to something that is going to be a little more um, challenging to measure, but it's, it is very helpful. So thank you for that information. I look forward, for, look forward to seeing even more uh, results that are representative of the hope and, and uh, connections that our students are making. I think we're going to be back in January to give a little more uh, in-depth report on MTSS and how some of the things what we're doing um, to address this. So thank you for your commitment to our students. Um, this whole child, right? And so I really appreciate it. Thank you. Miss Miss Global, can we go to the resources by secondary school? So our last two. Um, outrageous outcomes, right, are the ones we just talked about, and then also, you know, having, having hope for the future and every student graduating with a career path. Is there a line, or are there some of these resources that would align? I see counselor, everything up there is important. Mm -hmm. But we, we could talk about, we could have a career or, you know, college readiness counselor. Um, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just to speak to that, Delta, it's not on here, but we have someone who is both of those, and she has, her name is Ms. Muir, uh, Lisa Muir, and she's a wonderful person. Uh, she's taken on both of those roles, the college readiness and a uh, counselor, and I will just say that it, she is a very overworked, so if we're considering something like that to just make sure it's an, a different job or at least a half position because she's very overworked, so there is something like that, but we need to make sure to differentiate it. So I, I see, I think we have some probably past PASCO or Chiawana graduates here maybe. We, we talk about these counselors and we, we, when we talk to high school students sometimes they say they struggle to even get time to talk to their counselor about the classes that they're taking at that given time. I know we have nine counselors there at CHS, nine at PHS, but in the future if one of them or two of them is dedicated towards you know, 100% of their time toward career and college readiness. I, if they're not, I think we need that. If that's one of our outrageous outcomes, yes. and we could break it down there. Um, do you know? Do you know if we have dedicated? Turn this on. not connected to a classroom that do a variety of different things from supporting social emotional learning to supporting students who are not on track to graduate etc so i don't want the board to think that this is inclusive of all of the supplemental staff that we have at each of our schools these are the staff that were specific to this goal so uh, i would classify that if we do have those career and college counselors and a dedicated one, talking to somebody like that helps a student provide hope for their future. We need to have those discussions, not just about what we're doing today and what classes we're enrolling to get
get through our next four years. So I'm just saying, if we do have that, it, it could be yeah. it could be part of hope for the future to talk to career and and college counselors on one of those lines. But so one of the things that I, I will do for you is that like like Ms. Whitney said, that we we didn't th there's a there's a more comprehensive list, and we can definitely share that with you about what almost like what they do. But I know in December, my colleague's gonna come back and talk specifically about um, the, the, our fourth and actually third and fourth outreaches outcomes uh, together. Um, and then we can make sure to include how we're supporting students as they plan for their future. Because that, that's our next report and we'll make sure to include that. Okay. Appreciate that, thank yeah. you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Um, I did have one question about yeah. the slide on um, disciplinary violations. Um, did we only, for the 2020, 2021 school year, did we only take account for the years, of, I mean, the months that the school was open? And if we did, did we only take account for like the students that were enrolled in person school or was it throughout the entire school year? So you're talking about this one? Yes. So I asked you a question again, please. Um, was it for the 2020 to 2021 school year, was it only like during the, the month that school was open or was it throughout the entire school year? I think it was for the entire school year. So as you can see, there's a significant decrease, right? Because students were not in school, they were distance learning. So that's why you see this, this the, the decrease, but it was for the entire school year. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, but there were more questions from you guys than ever. It's great that you have such interest in this topic. I love it. All right, thank you. Any both. other questions? I think that's it, thank you. And uh, next we'll move on to agenda item number 11. We have extended studies and discussion here, Voting Rights Act um, in our election system and we have Ms. Sarah Thornton. Good evening again, uh, Vice President Lehrman, board members, and Superintendent Whitney. Uh, tonight we have another update for you regarding our Voting Rights Act work and our, uh, the work that the board is doing on revi potential revisions to the uh, district board of directors election system. Tonight will be the first night that we have a look at the uh, Example maps that are based on the 2020 census data. So we'll uh, go over that information with you. We'll also provide a brief update on our community information campaign activities that we have scheduled uh, coming up uh, in November. But first I'd like to revisit with the board our grounding in the guiding principles. So the maps that you are going to see that were drawn up as examples by our demographer, Dr. Peter Morrison, are based on these principles that we have discussed over the last several meetings. And, and they were most recently revised by the board on October 12th. So the whole purpose of the re potential revision to the election system is to ensure that uh, Pasco School District is complying with the Washington, Voters right, Bo Washington Voting Rights Act. The, demographics and the population in our community has uh, significantly changed over time. And to ensure that uh, all population groups within the community, all uh, population groups within the community are adequately represented, the district has been looking at changing from an at-large, five position at-large system to a director district system. Toward this goal, each map that you will see coming up has at least one majority Latino voting age population district uh, because as you'll see in the census data, our demographics have shifted such that our Latino population is now the majority population within Pasco School District. The maps are also drawn using the existing Franklin County election precincts to the extent possible. And I'll talk a bit more when we uh, look at those precinct maps uh, specifically to, to discuss what that looks like. 
We have not considered incumbency of the current board members. And as I said just a, a minute ago, we are now using the 2020 census data in our update. What you last directed us to do was to uh, narrow our selections down to a three district, four district, and a five district option. Now what that means is a three district option would have three voting districts or three director districts and two at-large positions. The four district system would have four voting districts and one at-large position. And then the five district option would be all director districts with no at-large positions. So those are the three options that we have on the table right now. I wanted to give you an overview of the Franklin County voting precincts that these maps are drawn up according to. And, and the reason being primarily is to orient you to some of the, the shapes of these precincts because what you'll see in the maps as we talk about them is the, the maps do not necessarily follow what we in the community would consider to be common geographic boundaries. So our streets, our freeways, those types of things. Uh, the, the voting precinct map is not drawn up according to those particular landmarks and so uh, neither are the uh, sample maps that, that we're going to take a look at. And then here is a close up of the districts that are more within the city of Pasco uh, as you move to the south by the uh, near the river. Um, based on the concentration of population, those districts are typically drawn, uh, drawn a bit smaller. And you can see that they vary in shape across the, uh, across the map. So first to touch on the shift in our demographics and the updated 2020 census data uh, regarding our population within Pasco School District, our Latino population in, within Pasco School District has grown to 55.21% with our white population at 37.8 uh, and about 7% of our population identifying uh, themselves as, as another race or ethnicity. And then what we see in our voting age population is that those same categories change just a little bit with the voting age Latino population coming in at 50.2% and the white population ticking up at 42.58%. So what that tells us is that our Latino population is younger uh, and is, will be aging into the voting age population over time. So the first uh, example map that we have for you is the example three district map and as I said before uh, this is drawn according to the Franklin County voting precinct map with district one is in the green and that's concentrated uh, primarily around uh, downtown Pasco towards central Pasco district two is the blue area to the west and to the north. And then uh, District 3 is the yellow area, uh, Central Pasco, and also to the north. Based on the drawing of that map, what you see is the total population and the total voting age population uh, in, on that map is relatively balanced. And, and that is one of the requirements that we would want to look at for Washington Voting Rights Act compliance. So the population is balanced and what we see here is that we in this map achieve one district with a uh, significant uh, Latino majority in district one uh, and non-majority in district two and district three. So we would call this a uh, one district Latino majority plan with the two, three. And again, this is the map that would give you uh, three director districts and two at-large positions. The second example map, this would provide you with four director district 
um, positions and one at-large position. District 1 is identified in the green. It has expanded from the previous map to capture some of the population north uh, in the northern part of the school district and also a bit to the west. The blue District 2 captures some central and north primarily within the city boundary. Uh, district 3 is the yellow and then District 4 to the, the west and to the, to the north. The boundary, the, the geographic boundaries, you'll see some of the larger areas primarily for two reasons. One, the uh, populations in the northern areas, there's just less concentration of population in North Pasco and also uh, conforms to the, uh, to the Franklin County voting precincts per the uh, direction we've received previously. This is what the breakout would look like on this example map. So again, you see that the total population and total voting age population would be relatively balanced. We would have a uh, strong Latino majority in District 1 uh, with another strong Latino majority in District 2 uh, and then District 3 and District 4 uh, would not be majority Latino districts. So in this configuration, you would have four director districts elected by their specific, within their specific district boundaries. Two of those districts would be majority Latino in population and then you would have one at-large position elected by the whole district. The final example map is an example of a five district plan. So in this configuration, you would not have any at-large positions. Each board of directors seat in this map would be elected uh, from within its own drawn boundary. Uh, and you can see how that breaks out uh, as far as the boundaries in this particular example. And demographically, again, uh, Dr. Morrison was able to achieve balance within the populations and we see two voting districts that are majority Latino. So again, you would have five director districts, no at-large positions, and two of those voting districts would be majority Latino districts. This next slide is just a summary of the basic plan features that sums up what, uh, what I just talked about. And before we move into uh, any direction and discussion, I did just want to uh, let you know that we plan to schedule two uh, community feedback meetings next week. We'll also be launching an online survey next week. Uh, the first meeting will be Monday, uh, November 15th at Pasco High School in the library. That meeting uh, will be in Spanish with English translation available. And then we'll be at Chiawana High School on the 18th. Um, this says we'll be in the student mall. I found out today we will not be in the student mall. We will probably be upstairs next to the library uh, and we'll confirm that and get that information out. Uh, but we will have those feedback opportunities next week. And if the uh, board directs us to continue on our current timeline, we would be set to move toward a public hearing, a formal public hearing on the 14th of December. So the questions that I would have for you uh, this evening would really be two. One would be whether uh, the board would want us to make any changes to the number of, uh, to the number of options that we would bring out to the community next week. Uh, and the second question would be uh, what if any variances would the board like to see in any of the maps uh, so that we could uh, provide that feedback for Dr. Morrison.
Thank you, Ms. Thornton. Any questions or comments from the board or student reps? Sure. So, and I can speak to that a little bit. I think that's a, I, I think that's a great question, Jennifer. The, um, so one of the things that we have to do uh, to be in compliance with the Washington Voting Rights Act when we draw uh, any director district maps is we have to balance our total population within those districts. So if we have a very um, small subgroup of the population, um, even if they're concentrated in one location of the district, we wouldn't be able to create just one specific district for that subgroup of the population because it would, it would put the rest of the districts out of balance. But that said, to see what the numbers would look like incorporating that into what we have, we can certainly ask our demographer to, to provide that. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, I understand that yeah. they're, they're small percentage. You're not going to draw the boundaries around them, but I would like to just see that where they're being placed, you know, and what what the other percentages look like. And then um, another question I did have, uh, and this is just kind of a general question because I wasn't aware: Are we sending this information out to high schoolers that are voting age? Because I know uh, a lot of seniors are turning 18, and they could potentially vote on this or um, I know there's election uh, there's things being uh, passed in February but mm -hmm. are, are we sending out this information to them at all or is this just going out to parents pretty much this would be the so a couple of things this particular decision is a board decision so the decision itself does not get voted on um, by the community like when we have our election in February but what we're seeking is um, input and feedback and we would be doing that both at the public meetings and through a survey and those uh, the survey the public meetings are open to anyone so uh, regardless of whether you are um, your voting age or going to be voting age if you have um, an opinion or feedback for us before um, we ask the board to take action on this. Anybody is welcome to, to respond to that. Thank you, Mrs. Thornton, for putting this together and working uh, with our demographer to get some some information for us. I know we've waited a long time for this. We've, uh, it, it's, I think we had some maps previously. We looked at different things, but we wanted to wait to get the, the most current census input into this. And so we've got that now, and this is a, this is a good start. Couple of questions. So as far as maps go, these are an option. Correct. These, the are, these are not final maps. These are not the only options. These are, this is one option. So these maps can re be revised. Correct. Um, so when we when we make our whatever it is in is it December the December meeting is it in December we have a hearing and then in January we we have to have a motion is that is correct. that the correct schedule? So when when do maps have to be finalized? Do you have that information? Can you get that information for us if you don't have it? I can get that information for you. My, my understanding is you would want to have it finalized before the formal public hearing, but I will verify that. Um, and our, our friend and colleague, Lee Marchesio, is here um, as well. He's also working with us on this project, so he can help us uh, track that down. Okay. So we're going to the community to get input 
what what kind of input are you seeking from the are you we are we are we expecting to get from community input is it is it on maps is it on which configuration in voter districts um, is it something else can you can you just enlighten us what these community forums community input meetings are going to be like and what we expect to get from them Absolutely. So what we will do at the uh, community meetings is we will have a presentation at the beginning of the meeting so that we can explain what it is that the, um, that, that the board is considering with the changes to the voting system and be able to answer any questions uh, so that if people want to learn more about this process and the thought uh, and rationale that's going into it, they could attend and learn that. We would also have example maps available with the same understanding that these are not the final maps. These are really just illustrative to give the community members an idea of what we're talking about when we say five districts or four districts or three districts, but this is not the final product necessarily as far as what that would look like. But what we found in the um, initial meeting that we had with our PAC at Pasco High School last month, it was difficult to have the conversation without having the context of an actual map so that, so that people could see, oh, that's what you're talking about when you, say, when you say five districts. As far as the survey, we will not be asking for feedback specifically on the maps. It will just be conceptually assuming that we could create you know two majority latino districts with each of these which configuration d would you prioritize and why so that the board can see both the prioritization of the community members but also get input and information as to why it's important to them okay so so right now we have three examples we have a three district four district and five district and only the four and the five district can with our current numbers have majority and minority but if we go to the table for this one we you know I think we talked about this last time in in public as well we didn't have the exact numbers but conceptually we talked about well if there's a district you got district one there with 82 percent um, Latino VAP and you got district three with 40% VAP can you make several districts that are more balanced and get two of them that are 60% or one that's 63% and one that's 57 that's that's work that's being done now and when you take this on the road show that that'll be discussed saying that we're trying to get to at least two majority and minority in all three plans in all three plans yes that's exactly what what we would do um, as as you said mr. Lehrman the the map the way on the three district plan the way that it's currently drawn um, does not capture two majority Latino districts and so what we'd like to explore with dr. Morrison is whether it is possible within the uh, the boundaries if you will of the Washington Voting Rights Act because there's several um, different boxes we need to be able to check with with the maps uh, but if we can check those boxes and create two majority Latino um, districts with the the three district map we, we would want him to try to do that so I, I just uh piggybacking off of that question so here we've got uh, I mean we've got one that is that is significantly more or a higher percentage of Latino voting age population is that is that the goal is to get a one district that has a significant m majority or I mean is there is there a threshold is there a or because it looks like you could balance you know, and again, looking at that, I don't know what the map would look like, but, but it looks like you could balance this one. I mean, this one would be, would be unfavorable because of all the scenarios, there's only one majority minority district, but it looks like you could create two majority minority districts just with numbers. Sure. So, so one of the, th oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chris. No, no, go I ahead. Cut, I did not mean to cut you off. The, 
Um, it, it really depends on where the populations, where the population concentrations are situated um, and, and how that works out as far as creating contiguous districts on the map. Um, but the threshold generally that we would be, be going for would be in the 60% range um, to be able to account for other factors beside the, uh, the voting age population, other factors that, that might not allow um, individuals to participate in voting. So to achieve the, um, the minor or the, uh, the majority control and alleviate potential vote dilution, that would be the, the range that we'd be looking at. 60 plus. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly the more, the better. And I want to, I'm just looking at these here. So, I, so I guess one of my comments would be just looking at that, those numbers, that this would bias this, this map into non-existence, right? Because all the others, the three, there are the four district and five district have two majority minority districts. This one doesn't, but it looks like it could because the 80 is so high. And so I'm wondering if we, you know, again, these meetings are happening next week, so we're probably not going to get a revised map by then. But, yeah. but, um, and I know there's, I think there's a, there's certain, there's people that want to have more districts and fewer at large, and I, I understand that. I, but I think that that biases this one because this one shows only one, where I think we could really create two. Um, and I do think with the, if I can just respond to that, I think that the way that Mr. Lehrman framed the, que just framed the question would be the same way that we would take that question to the community and we could be clear in our communication in the presentation um, if, if you want us to continue to explore that three district plan that that's exactly what we, we are trying to do with that map. Well, and I, I think that I think that should be pointed out that you know these maps are not final there could certainly be it, it certainly appears that there would be a scenario where this is a where there, where you could have three districts two of which have majority minority populations or voting age population and and you're going to ask for pros and cons or why they have a preference for one of the uh, one or the other so like if if we were able to get two majority and minority in this plan right here but the majority of people preferred four districts or five districts and all three plans had two majority minority. Why do you like three better than four? Or why do you like four better than three? Mm -hmm. that, that's the kind of input you're gonna solicit? Correct. We try to keep the survey very simple um, for two reasons. One, uh, people, would pref people typically prefer to take shorter surveys than longer surveys. Uh, but also to um, be able to allow the board to access um, the opinions without um, influence if, if we keep the questions pretty broad. Is there a way to, I mean, the more simple the survey you have, the more easy it is to skew it by voting over and over again if it's two questions or three questions without any name or anything. Is there any way to, try your best to ensure that we get, you know, the correct weighted average survey of one, one per person versus we get 50 surveys and 35 of them are from one person. <laughs> I, I will work with my friend, Mr. Garrett, to okay. try to do our best to make sure that does not happen. All right. <laughs> Hopefully we have a lot more surveys than 50 that are returned, but well, you get, you, you understand the sure. concern. And along those lines, on the survey, I mean, I, if it's an online survey, it could be somebody in New York taking the survey, correct? I mean, I would, Here. I would hope we at least put a question in there and hope people to be honest. Uh, do you live in the district, yeah. or you? Yeah, do you live in the district? Not, not. Does your grandkid go to the district? Sure. Do you live in the district? Can you, so. can you send paper copies home with kids still, or is that too antiquated to give to their parents? 
what we would do would be to, we could potentially send a paper home notifying them of the survey, but even we're not really sending as many paper flyers home anymore. We're using uh, Dojo and other electronic forms to get that information home. So I, I do have another question on these maps, a couple of maybe a couple of questions on these maps. So voter precincts, the we've we've tried to follow those we have followed those i mean I, there's yeah so so the question would be are we anticipating these changing anytime soon because the the uh, the census data i would expect is going to influence these as well i don't know that but if i, I would expect it would if you don't have that information could you please get that for us and and even include that in your presentations to the uh, to the community as well. The other thing is, I'm I'm looking at these maps, and I, I don't have a big blow up version up, so I can't see things really close. But uh, I know last time we talked about incumbency, and, and one of the things that one of my objectives in incumbency or not including that is because I didn't want to see a bunch of maps that had special cutouts. But in looking at these maps, as near as I can tell, there, I mean, we have the airport area, which which has very little population, but but is very convenient to make things contiguous. Um, the of communities that aren't connected, and so I I, I understand the the desire to follow the voter precincts, but I me I think it would be more important to keep some of these communities together this is a great example right here so just down in the down in the bottom you can see uh, some ups and downs in there and then uh, the, the, the blue area between the blue and the green you can see some diversions into both incursions into both areas I'm not I'm not sure if that's voter precincts if that's the way it had to be done because uh, the, to get the population balance and then you can see the airport and then it goes up and picks up that community up there that's not even connected to the rest of them but because of the airport it's contiguous sure. and I think there's a, a couple of the others too that have the same types of things so my question would be this are we do we have to follow the precincts because are they changing? And if not, can't we balance those out a little bit more to get representative districts of not just voter population, but people that are neighbors sure. and not, not cut up so much? I think that map. And this one here, yeah, has some, has some interesting lines. The yellow, between the yellow I can't really tell what it does down there, but it looks like there's a little neck that comes in. Oh, maybe I, oh, maybe it's up on the top. It just pokes into the yellow up there. But anyway, so just wondering if there's a way to smooth some of that out, if we have to be loyal to the precincts, if there's not a better way to, to represent actual communities sure. as opposed to. So, so the question the question makes complete sense. Um, I don't have an answer for the first question around uh, whether or not the voting precincts as they're drawn right now by the county would be changing. Um, so we will find out and, and get that information to you. The adherence to the voting precincts themselves was one of the uh, guiding principles that we started working on originally, primarily because it provided a fairly neutral foundation from which to start. So there are other factors uh, within the Washington Voting Rights Act that also uh, at, would have us create districts that are, like I said, contiguous or relatively compact. So there may be ways to smooth out at, as it were, some of those um, some of those oddly shaped districts where we have parts of the community, um, especially um, I'm looking at the area that would be near the airport or between Oregon Avenue and 
there, there where, where you have industrial moving to um, moving to residential, some of those areas to try to smooth those out in a, in a way that's more natural. Yeah, I think that just keeps communities together. Sure. So, and, and I don't know if there's, if there's an easy solution to that, but I, but it, it appears that part of the objective was to get the percentage of the Latino population as high as it could be, which I understand, mm -hmm. but, uh, I think uh, I think also important is keeping communities together. So I don't know that the Voting Rights Act considers that. But Fair enough. Any other questions or comments for Ms. Thornton? Yeah, I I would like to make a comment. Um, I I really appreciate in this map that that um, when you when you take out all of the people in the map that the number of voting people and the number of population is very uh, is very similar. I was just impressed with how we're not going to have tiny um, tiny voting populations to pull from to get candidates and I think that's really important. So I uh, you know I think if we can iron out some of those rough edges and try not to get where the the airport, um, you know, separates communities or the railroad separates communities because it's really hard to get back and forth across those. It makes, a railroad makes for hard neighbors. It's nice to be in and, you know, have those precincts in neighborhoods where you can actually walk and, and get to easily, which is great. But I also think it's really, really important that we make sure that we have an, a large voting population in all of them and that and that those populations are, are equal the then and and I really the population the the people available to vote I just appreciate how well that they did that so I would like you to keep that in mind was that clear absolutely what I hear you speaking to mrs. Phillips is uh, is that balance in in the numbers and uh, and and we will that that is one of the guideposts that we do need to follow so I think to be clear that's voting age population. That's not eligible voters. Correct. It's just, that's just the age. So, that's right. So that you, I mean, you could have vastly different numbers of voters, eligible voters, not just registered, but eligible voters within those populations, even though that voting age population is balanced. So it, it, that that needs to be made clear mm -hmm. as as we go forward, especially in these community meetings not have that information on the same paper I thought we had it all on there together what we have is uh, here is total population and then total voting age population uh, and I do have uh, registered voter information uh, that I can share with you as well that just came in literally um, right before the board meeting uh, for mr. Montgomery I think that's a really important piece of information is the registered voters in each area. I think it's important to keep in mind that the Voting Rights Act doesn't care about the number of registered voters. That, 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 that doesn't speak to that. It's, it's simply voting age, it's total population, voting age population, and percentage of minority voting age population. That's important though to have enough registered voters to draw candidates from so I, I still think that's something we should keep in mind Can I answer any other any questions other or questions? comments for miss Thornton okay so you're you're gonna take this on the road can you repeat the schedule again for when you're gonna take these three plans along with the words that we wrote up um, on the three district plan. You were, you, yes, <laughs> yes I can. We will be um, at Pasco High School on Monday. We will be at Chiawana on Thursday next week. We will also be launching an online survey in English and Spanish with uh, a explanatory presentation uh, for members of the public in English and Spanish to be able to learn more 
uh, about the options and what the board is considering. Okay, thanks for repeating that for us. I know you said it earlier in the meeting. Um, so it sounds like the board might be interested just to kind of see the, the language that you're gonna use in that. You guys interested in seeing that in a Friday update? Yeah, along, or, or she said, she told us what she's gonna say. Would you like to see that? I would I if it's ready for the Friday update. Yeah, I mean, I we'll see the survey. I, I, I trust you'll you'll. Uh, I mean, I don't know that we need to. Is it a, is it a slide? We don't need to approve anything, but is it a slideshow you're going to present, or is it just a talk along with the with the maps? At the meetings, we would do a slideshow a slideshow presentation, uh, and I would need to work with public affairs as far as how to make that also accessible to an online audience um, as well. On, on these meetings, so I would like to attend them. Is there, is just to hear the community input, I, I don't necessarily want to say anything, but I don't know how my fellow board members feel or how you feel about that is. Uh, the only thing that I would ask, I, I think, of course, as board members, you're welcome to attend. I would ask that no more than two of you attend any given meeting uh, so that we don't have a, um, an OPMA violation potentially. Um, but they, they are meetings that are, that are open to the public. I think it would be fine to have you there. The, the format, though, just to be clear, we'll be doing the, uh, we'll, we'll be structuring it much like we did during our last school boundary process. So we'll have the presentation at the beginning and then we will have information around the room and available for individuals to, um, to look at and to ask questions. Um, then they can either access the online survey or fill out something uh, there if they'd like to, to fill out something by paper while they're there. Um, so it won't be, it, it will not be structured like a general um, open mic kind of a scenario, but rather we'll present the information and then um, open it up so that they can walk around and look at the, the different options and we can answer questions. So you would be able to send the board the presentation before the Monday presentation. Okay, appreciate that. Any other questions or comments from the board? Just, uh, I'm assuming Jenny will coordinate attendance at these. All right, thank you, Ms. Thornton. Thank you. Next, we have uh, future agenda items. So on the 23rd, uh, historically, the school board has conducted a retreat immediately following the WASDA conference. That's on the agenda. I'll work with board officers to determine the, ag the agenda items for the retreat. Typically, it's been a debrief of the learning from WASDA. There's been years where you went over your board self-assessment, et cetera, but again, I'll work with board officers. In uh, December, we will be uh, swearing in a new board member. We'll also focus on long-term facilities, management planning, defining whatever kind of committee, um, purpose or the purpose of any kind of committee work you want done or the charge and parameters of that work. And then during the board meeting, we'll have a report from our student board representatives on their learning from WASDA, and then also our outrageous outcome reports on both graduation and ninth grade on track and then a discussion around uh, a naming or uh, transportation facilities. You received a letter from a community member employee who is requesting that, that we launch a naming process and um, has submitted a specific name for, for that process. So um, those are the next couple board meetings. All right, thank you, Ms. Whitney. Next we have communications. Maybe we'll mix it up tonight and we'll end with Miss Lankin since it's her last board meeting. Let's uh, start with Jenny. Um, I mean, I just, I was glad that we got to go over the uh, outrageous outcome number five. I, I personally like that one the most just because I am a really big advocate for hope and I'm glad that we're instilling that in the Pasco School District and we care more for our students rather than the than the data that they output. Thank you, Jenny. Jason? Um, yeah, I, I agree with, with Jenny. I think it was really nice to see the outrageous outcome. I think it's really important to me, Jennifer, and Brooklyn. 
especially with what we're trying to do with the student, superintendent student advisory council. And as well, I would like to um, acknowledge Ms. Jerry Lincoln for last meeting with us. And I'd like to he, uh, point out that I did hear that today well, she has been part of the board for 14 years. And I think that's really impressive. And I just want to congratulate her for that. <laughs> Brooklyn. Um, so firstly, I just want to thank Ms. Thornton's presentation that she recently gave, just talking about redistricting. I think that's something that um, many community members have been coming in to talk about. And so it's pretty clearly a um, big topic of discussion and something that we are all passionate about. And so I look forward to, um, within the next couple months, receive some of that community feedback and hopefully make a decision. Um, that will positively impact the community as best as we can do in compromise. And I look forward to going to Wazda next week. So that's something I think all three of us are really excited about. Ms. Whitney? So I also want to express just my sincere gratitude to Sherry for her decade above, or uh, over a decade of service to this community as a, as a board member. And I also want to thank Sherry personally for allowing me the opportunity to be a superintendent in a, in a community, in a district I've loved my whole life. You've been a phenomenal mentor to me and just an amazing example of grit and grace in some of the most extraordinarily difficult times that I've seen as a public educator. So. You will always be in our hearts, Sherry, as we do this work, and we and many of us will work really hard to live up to the dedication that you've modeled for all of us. So thank you so much, and please forgive me for the plaque. I know you told me no, but I just couldn't, couldn't. You needed a plaque. I also wanted to acknowledge and recognize that tonight is Shane Edinger's last board meeting with us. Uh, Shane will leave us and. Um, move out of the industry of education and into the industry of the Hanford area. So um, we are grateful, Shane, for being the voice of our district, and you will be missed, and you've left a legacy of amazing tools here for those of us who are left doing the work to use, and we just are so appreciative to you and wish you the very best. And I'm fairly certain we're going to need Charlotte sightings um, often, so please don't be a stranger. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Whitney. So as Brooklyn mentioned, and as we said for our next, our next board meeting will be a study session to debrief on WASDA. WASDA, like we said, is our annual conference that alternates between Bellevue and Spokane. This year it's in Bellevue. Last year it was all online, so the students weren't able to attend. Board members weren't able to attend other than, than remotely. So for those of you um, student members going, we're excited to have you go. As board members, it's always good to go and, and have professional development and, and learn what's new. S since we haven't been for two years in person, it's going to be a great time. Um, let's see. I appreciate the uh, community events that happened, uh, trick-or-treating for Halloween at a lot of the schools. Uh, was able to make it over to Robinson. My youngest kids didn't. Um, for, for other reasons, but my oldest daughter had volunteered to uh, take her mom's car, even though she can't drive, and have it decorated to, to trunk or treat. So we took the car over there, um, did handed out candy for trunk or treat over at Robinson. Then the kids that didn't get to go, the little kids didn't get to trick or treat. They wanted to go a couple nights later. I think Columbia River had a trunk or treat, so they went and got a couple pieces of candy. So. Thank you to all the volunteers around the district that um, do stuff above and beyond outside of, of school hours to foster that uh, community involvement with our, with our families and children outside the um, normal school day. And um, we said it earlier, thank you again, Ms. Lankin. Move on to Mr. Christensen. So uh, not last weekend, but the weekend before, we had our WASDA General Assembly. We voted on a number of uh, new positions and then some that were revised and combined, which happens every, every year as we try and, try and narrow them down to uh, not, such, not so many so that at least our liaisons on the Hill can keep track of them all. 
we started at uh, 10 o'clock on Friday, finished at 6 o'clock on Friday. We're back at it 10 o'clock the next morning, and we were done by noon. So it, it was, uh, wasn't quite as long as it had been in the past, but we did start earlier on Friday. So it was, it was plenty long. I was able to attend the state cross country meet this last weekend, and those, those events always inspire me. Cross country is a unique sport. It's, it's like wrestling, it is you. There is no team out there to support you. You are, you are it, and everybody's watching you. And uh, I was just impressed by the, uh, you know, the encouragement of parents and spectators and of their teammates. It, it, it just is an inspiring event. If, you, uh, if you've not attended one of those, I would recommend it. We've got annual conference coming up. I am looking forward to that. And Jason, I'm sure you're looking forward to that too, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> Jason, Jason is going to represent the Pasco School District as a student rep. I believe that's still on, isn't it, Jason? Yes, it is. Good. So we will look forward to that. And then Sherry, again, congratulations. And thank you for your years of service. It will be different not having you on the board. It will be a significant change. So, and we'll... We'll uh, continue and uh, try and do the work that you've uh, helped us get going. So I appreciate that. And again, we wish you the best. I'd just like to thank Sherry for everything. And I've been here a little over a year, and uh, I've seen Sherry's spunkiness and uh, passion, though, too, for our school district and our kids. So uh, I'm just really grateful that I had the opportunity to work with you and uh, just to see your passion is really inspiring and I uh, just say thank you because you have impacted my life by seeing that so I appreciate you and everything that you've done for our district so thank you so we don't want to sell you short though Mr. Campos you've almost been with us two years two years time flies oh yeah this <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> two wow. years two years all right Miss Lincoln take it away well I just want to say thank you and um it's been, it has been a long time. <laughs> uh, because I worked for the, I worked and volunteered for long before I ever became a school board member. So just thank you and I appreciate all the help and inspiration that I've had since I've been on the school board. So just thank you. That's it. All right. Thanks. Th thank you for inspiring us <coughs> to serve and inspiring many of our staff and, and uh, students with the work that you did. So with that, um, we have an executive session. What do we have? 4231101G, personal, personal superintendent evaluation, personnel, uh, quarterly review. And we have right. a change here, 423110I litigation as well. So we actually have another change. We're, mm -hmm. You are uh, limited only to 423110G for the personnel uh, superintendent evaluation quarterly review. So we are not requesting the executive session for litigation. So okay. And eye. how long do we expect it to take? Uh, that would be up to you as a board. You do the quarterly review. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll plan for 30 minutes. All right. And with that, thank you for coming this evening. We'll recess into executive session.